Hi everyone. Today I want to delve a little bit more into this history behind Prince Charles or as they're calling him now King Charles, King of the United Nations Sustainable Development or King of the Environmental Movement which is at the moment destroying our lives and sending us back into a feudal system. Is King Charles the Antichrist, as some people are calling him? I mean, he's definitely an Antichrist, but is he the Antichrist or is he what I think the King of Dragons or the Dragon King? I've been away for a long time. I'm very busy these days. I don't have a lot of time to make videos, but I've been trying to finish this video and I've just found this information recently and I wanted to just bring it to you to sort of wrap up my research on the Herods and you know what I've seen in the Bible and what's been revealed here through history I think that we are under the control of an aristocracy that has been extremely powerful for pretty much um, the last 2,000 years since the fall of the Roman Empire and, you know, we've been under the power of this aristocracy and this aristocracy isn't even an Israelite aristocracy. It's not even European. It's, it's of the Herods. It's an Edomite pharisaical aristocracy and it rules us through banking, through politics, and through religion. It's the little horn of the Roman Empire. And we need to all come to realize exactly who they are. So I talked about the True Stream Media video where they point out that Prince Charles was crowned under this sustainable development crown of the UN here in this image symbolically making him king of the UN and the environmental movement. It says in this article, Prince Charles has launched a project to urge world leaders to forge a more sustainable future and put nature at the heart after the coronavirus outbreak. Called the Great Reset, the heir to the throne has joined with the World Economic Forum to call for changes in economic and social systems to make them fairer and more resilient. There's nothing fair about it. The Great Reset will be the theme of a twin summit held by the WEF in January 2021. Charles 71 is a decades-long campaigner in the environmental field, first speaking about the problems of plastic more than 50 years ago. And I've noticed since the coronation of the king in my country, we can no longer buy plastic bags for shopping. So all of the supermarkets have gotten rid of the plastic bags, which I don't have a problem with, to be honest. But they used to have brown paper bags, which they replaced with the plastic bags. So, I mean, these people, these big businesses and companies that use these products can't seem to make their mind up. And then if they do the wrong thing, it's, they can just blame the customers for buying too many plastic bags. On the launch, he said, in order to secure our future and to prosper, we need to evolve our economic model and put people and planet at the heart of global value creation, whatever that means. If there is one critical lesson to learn from this crisis, it is that we need to put nature at the heart of how we operate. We simply can't waste more time. So Prince Charles says climate change is humanity's greatest threat. I'm more inclined to believe that our greatest threat has been this Edomite aristocracy that's been ruling over us and dictating to us for at least a thousand years. And, you know, when we look at the reality of climate change, there's absolutely nothing we can do about it and it's not anything to do with us the climate on Earth changes regardless of what we do to it. The only problem we really do have on this Earth is environmental poisoning by these companies like Monsanto selling their poisons that leach into the water system and contaminate our environment, poisoning us all in, in our food. Davos, Switzerland, Britain's Prince Charles said, 
on Wednesday that global warming and climate change are the greatest threats that humanity has faced, calling on business leaders in Davos to act now to create a sustainable economic future. In a speech to the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, WEF, in the Swiss ski resort, the British heir to the throne said, it was time for everyone in a leadership role to take action at revolutionary levels and pace. And isn't this what COVID is? And why is everyone obeying Prince Charles or King Charles, Charles III? We are in the midst of a crisis that is now, I hope, well understood, he said. Global warming, climate change and devastating loss of biodiversity are the greatest threats that humanity has ever faced and one largely of our own creation. No, it's not of our own creation. Is King Charles or Prince Charles just a figurehead of the WEF? Or is he the king of it? Is he someone that they all follow? And I would like to propose here that the British royal family has far more power than everybody has given them credence for. In the past few years, the British royal family has been considered outdated or the idea that they have no power. And in this video, I'd like to maybe challenge that idea that perhaps this family is actually at the center of everything that is happening. And, you know, in saying this, I'm not in any way undermining the role of the Jesuits, the Vatican, the Freemasons, any of these organizations. But, you know, we know from all the imagery and the orders that these people are part of that they are, in fact, the families that promote and in the first place instigated any of these orders. I think that when we look at court banking in the Holy Roman Empire uh, in Germany and when we look at the Khazarian or Jewish banking elite that everybody points a finger at also, I think they might be actually puppets of this family. Not only are they super wealthy with assets and properties hidden in secret bank accounts, they don't have to pay for anything. It's all paid by the taxpayer of the Commonwealth. So the saxe coburg gotha Acker windsor family and here it's saying, in a comment, the saxe coburg gotha are all regions of Germany. These are German Jews or Talmudic Jews or flat-out usurpers of the British crown. They are descendants of pirates who basically murdered and manipulated to take over the British crown. They are not even British. Clues that tell us Philip had Jewish blood. And here's the woman in question, very close together eyes which seems to be a genetic trait of these people. Prince Philip's grandfather was said to be of Jewish ancestry through his mother, Julia Therese Salome Hulk. As the country mourns HRH -H Prince Philip, it may come as a surprise that it is generally accepted he had a Jewish great-grandmother. Prince Philip's parents were Prince Andrew of Greece and Princess Alice, daughter of Princess Victoria of Hesse. His maternal grandparents were Louis Alexander Mountbatten, first Marquess of Milford Haven, and Princess Victoria of Hesse, granddaughter of Queen Victoria. It is an unconfirmed story, thus Battenberg cake was first baked for the marriage of Prince Louis and Princess Victoria. In 1917, the family gave up their German titles and took the name of Mountbatten. Louis Mountbatten, Prince Philip's grandfather, was said to be of Jewish ancestry through his mother, Julia Therese Salome Hayek. Julia's father was John Maurice Hayek, a distinguished German soldier who was appointed Deputy Minister of War of Congress Poland. When his family were elevated to the rank of counts, Julia automatically became a countess. So here we have a Jewish family elevated to the rank of counts. Now, how many more families did this happen to? especially with the court Jewish bankers of the Holy Roman Empire. A lot of them were elevated to noble status and intermarried with aristocracy, who I think way back were even back then descendant from Roman Edomite unions. When we look at the aristocracy, 
never in history have they considered themselves as part of the people of the nation. You know, a king is supposed to be the father of a nation because the nation is a family and the king is the father of that family. But, you know, when have these kings and queens and aristocracy ever considered themselves to be of the same stock as the people that they rule? And I don't think they ever have been, to be honest. I think they are a separate breed that simply have this attitude that they have God-given right to own and rule the world and everything in it. And they use our servitude to make themselves wealthy and live off the cream of the land. So if we look into the divine right of kings, it says that in European Christianity, the divine right of kings, divine right of God's mandation is a political and religious doctrine of political legitimacy of a monarchy. It is also known as the divine right theory of kingship. The doctrine asserts that the monarch is not accountable to any earthly authority such as a parliament or pope well let's put it this way the pope is a king and a high priest of the roman catholic church and empire because their right to rule is derived from divine authority thus the monarch is not subject to the will of the people of the aristocracy or of any other estate of the realm Uh, let's not forget that king charles is also a high priest and king he's king of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, as well as the leader of the Protestant Church of England. It follows that only divine authority can judge a monarch and that any attempt to depose the throne, resist or restrict their power, runs contrary to God's will and may constitute a sacrilegious act. It does not imply that their power is absolute. In its full-fledged form, the divine right of kings is associated with Henry VIII of England, James VI and I of Scotland and England, and Louis XIV of France and their successors. I wonder where these people all got this concept from. In contrast, conceptions of rights developed during the Age of Enlightenment, for example, during the American French revolutions, often emphasize liberty and equality as being among the most important of rights but I think this was just to uh, place another type of authority over us. Divine right has been a key element of the self-legitimization of many absolute monarchs. Pre-Christian conceptions. Kvarina is an Iranian and Zoroastrian concept which literally means glory about divine right of the kings. This may stem from early Mesopotamian culture where kings were often regarded as deities after their death. Shulgi of Ur was among the first Mesopotamian rulers to declare himself to be divine. In the Iranian view, kings would never rule unless Varina, hope I'm saying that right, is with them, and they will never fall unless Varina leaves them. For example, according to Ka Namag of Dasha, when Adasha I of Persia and Artabanus V of Parthia fought for the throne of Iran. On the road, Artabanus and his contingent are overtaken by an enormous ram, which is also following Ardasha. Artabanus' religious advisors explain to him that the ram is the manifestation of the Quara, or the ancient Iranian kings, which is leaving Artabanus to join Adisha. The imperial cult of ancient Rome identified Roman emperors and some members of the official members of their families with the divinely sanctioned authority and of the Roman state. The official offer of cultus to the living emperor acknowledged his office and rule as divinely approved and constitutional. His principate should therefore demonstrate pious respect for traditional republican deities and mores. Many of the rites, practices and statutes, distinctions that characterize the cult of emperors were perpetuated in the theology and politics of the Christian Empire. Judaism, while the earliest reference to kingship in Israel proclaimed that when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me, he may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from your brothers who shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you. Now, this is important because God didn't really want Israel to have a king. 
but certainly he doesn't want that king to be a foreigner and that's exactly what we have today who is not your brother deuteronomy 17 14 to 15 significant debate on the legitimacy of kingship has persisted in rabbinical judaism until the mammonids though many mainstream currents continue to reject the notion. The controversy is highlighted by the instructions of the Israelites in the above quoted passage, as well as a passage in 1 Samuel 8 and 12, concerning the dispute over kingship and Pereshat Shoftim. It is from 1 Samuel 8 that the Jews receive Mishfat Hamalek, the Ayas Regim or the law of kingship and from this passage the Mammonids finally concludes that Judaism supports the institution of monarchy stating that the Israelites had been given three commands upon entering the land of Israel to designate a king for themselves to wipe out the memory of Amalek and to build a temple. There is leeway for a king over us in the Bible but it wasn't God's original plan and he wasn't according to first Samuel Israel was warned that if they put a king over them that their their grandchildren would be enslaved. And what Israel actually did in the time of the Maccabees is, is incorporate Amalek or Edom into the nation. The debate has primarily centered around the problem of being told to designate a king which some rabbinical sources have argued is an invocation against the divine right of kings and a call to elect a leader and opposition to the notion of a divine right. Who cares about rabbinical arguments? They're Edomites. With the rise of firearms, nation states and the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, the theory of divine right justified the king's absolute authority in both political and spiritual matters. Henry VIII of England declared himself the supreme head of the Church of England and exerted the power of the throne more than any of his predecessors. As a political theory, it was further developed by James VI of Scotland and came to the fore in England under his reign as James I of England. Louis XIV of France strongly promoted the theory as well. The concept of divine right incorporates but exaggerates the ancient Christian concept of royal God-given rights, which teach that the right to rule is anointed by God, although this idea is found in many other cultures including Aryan and Egyptian traditions. The pagan religions, the king was often seen as God incarnate and so was an unchangeable despot. The ancient Roman Catholic tradition overcame this idea with the doctrine of the two swords and so achieved for the first time a balanced constitution for states. The advent of Protestantism saw something of a return of the idea of a mere unchallengeable despot. So when his family were elevated to the ranks of counts, Julia automatically became a countess. Hulk was killed during the Polish-Russian War in 1830 and the children were made wards of the Tsar. Julia's mother, Sophia Lafontaine, was the daughter of Marcus Antoni de Comella. Julia was serving as lady-in-waiting for the wife of the future Tsar, Alexander II, when a romance developed between her and the Tsarian's brother, Prince Alexander of Hesse. They both left the court and by the time they were able to marry, Julia was six months pregnant. The marriage took place on the 28th of October 1851, but Julie was considered to be of insufficient rank to qualify for the succession to the Hessian throne, and so the marriage was considered to be morgantic, a legal marriage between someone of noble birth and a partner of lower rank with an agreement that any assets of the noble partner will not be shared by the commoner of their offspring. She was created Countess Battenberg in 1851 and then elevated to the title of Princess of Battenberg and the Battenbergs became a morgantic branch of the Ducal family of Hesse. Her line of descent includes the Jewish ancestry of not only Prince Philip's grandfather Louis Mountbatten but Alexander, Prince of Bulgaria and current generations of the Spanish royal family. There are similarities between ancestral history of H.R.H. Prince Philip and the consort of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, both are considered to have been modernisers, both had a difficult time with the English court and both had difficult childhoods. Additionally, both were rumoured to be of Jewish descent. In the case of Prince Albert, it was strongly suspected by many that he was not the son of Ernst, the first Duke of Saxe Coburg Gotha. Ernst's 18-year-old wife, Princess Louise, 
had been desperately unhappy married to an adulterous husband and it was said that she had an affair with an underservant of the Dowager Duchess Augusta of Coburg at Scholas Ehrenberg. As a result, she was banished from her home and her family, Louise's son Albert, now the motherless child, was brought up as the son of the Duke but was never allowed to see his mother again. The servant was named as Frederick Bloom. Bloom, whose Jewish family originated in Turkums, now in Latvia, then married an attractive widow as a Christian. His descendants settled in London where there was apparently a close resemblance to the Prince Consort of England and this story was handed down in their family. So there was other men rumoured to be Prince Albert's father so it is merely conjectured to say it was Bloom but if it were correct then most of the royal families of Europe and all the descendants of Queen Victoria would have a strain of Jewish DNA. So here we have this family line here, Johann Moritz, it's a Jewish name, Count of Hayek, and here it says Moritz, this is from Ancestry.com, German, Dutch, Danish and Jewish Ashkenazic from the personal name of Moritz, a variant of Moritz from Latin, Moritus, see Morris, and I know Morris is a Belgian Jewish name. Among Jews, it was sometimes assumed as a surname by bearers of the personal names Mordecai and Moses. His father was Frederick Carl Emanuel Hayek. The mother, Sophia Lafontaine, related to Epstein and D. Epstein. Interesting. It's interesting when you start looking through the surnames of these people's ancestral lines because here we have one here, Katharina Polixene of Solms Rodham. And I wonder if this is uh, some kind of relation maybe to Hillary Clinton, Hillary Rodham Clinton. I don't think it's spelt the same, but, you know, how do we know? So when we look at the court Jews of Germany, we've got Samuel Blight Schroeder, Mayer Amschel Rothschild. Further down, we have some of the mentioned names of the court Jews, Solomon and Burr Mayer. So we've got a Mayer on the side of the family line of Prince Philip. Jacob Bassevi, the first Jew to be ennobled with the title of von Truenberg. Important as court Jews also were Samuel Oppenheimer, and Samson Wethermere of Worm. So here we have this Wethermere family name, court Jews, Merle Wethermere. We look at their family line. They're married into the Oppenheimer family. Wethermere, Oppenheimer, Ballin, Bacharach. Bacharach's another family name for the Rothschilds. Uh, on the mother's side, Oppenheimer, Bacharach, Ballin. So I kind of have this theory about where the aristocracy of today originate from. And so we have Leo, the first king of Armenia, Romanized Levin the first, was the 10th lord of Armenian Cilicia, ruling from 1187 to 1219, and the first king to be crowned in 1198, nine, sometimes known as Levin the first, the magnificent. During his reign, Leo succeeded in establishing Cilician Armenia as a powerful and unified Christian state with a preeminence in political affairs. Leo eagerly led his kingdom alongside the armies of the Third Crusade and provided the Crusaders with provisions, guides, pack animals and all manner of aid under the rule of Armenian power in Cilicia. A skilled diplomat and wise politician, Leo established useful alliances with many of the contemporary rulers, he also gained the friendship and support of the Hospitallers and Teutonic Knights by granting considerable territories to them. Commerce was greatly developed during the reign of Leo. He granted charters regarding trade and commercial privileges to Genoa, Venice and Pisa. These charters provided their holders with special tax exemptions in exchange for their merchandising trade. They encouraged an establishment of Italian merchant communities in Tarsus, Adana and Mamistra and became a large source of revenue for the growth and development of Cilician Armenia. 
So on this coin or seal of King Leo, we see him sitting on what seems to be two frogs. The cross in his hand and a fleur de lis in his other hand, um, which was a symbol used around the 12th century by the French royalty. On the other side, we have what appears to be a lion with a cross. Now, it's a lion because it doesn't have a cloven foot like a lamb. And there's also a rose here on the coin. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the lamb of God symbol. So the lamb with the cross staff and we have the Georgian St. George cross. Now, Georgia is very close to Lesser Armenia or Cilicia, where this kingdom was from. So it reminds me a lot of the Venetian flag of the lion with the solar disc around its head, supposedly with its paw on the Bible and the wings of the Zoroastrian god on its back. We can see in this image here that uh, Georgia, where the St. George story of St. George comes from, and Armenia are very close. Lesser Armenia or Cilicia was along the Black Sea here at the bottom, um, very close to Turkey and Georgia. When we look at the trading deals between Cilicia and King Leo and the, with Genoa and Venice. The prevalence of urban domestic slave labour in medieval Europe peaked in the 14th century when Genoa and Venice maintained colonies and shipping networks that enabled them to import thousands of Tatar, Russian and Circassian and Balkan slaves. This is in Cambridge University Press. The Black Sea, Russia and Eastern Europe exported slaves through the medieval period. Most had been born free but were enslaved through capture or occasionally through sale by relatives. During the 8th through 10th century, slaves were traded from Eastern Europe and the Baltic to elite households in Byzantium and the Islamic world via the Dnieper and Volga river systems, the Carolingian Empire and Venice. In the 13th century, the structure of the slave trade changed as a result of the Mongol invasion of Eastern Europe, Italian colonization of the Black Sea, the success of the Mamluk state and the crusading activities of Teutonic Knights in the Baltic. People enslaved in the Baltic now tended to be traded westward rather than eastward. People enslaved in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus tended to pass through the Black Sea into Italian, Mamluk or Ottoman hands. and. People enslaved in the Balkans were trafficked primarily by Venetians or Ottomans. Many aspects of these trades deserve further study, however, such as political marginality and decentralization as factors that enabled slaving violations of the principle that slaves should come from a different religious background than their owners and the logistics of local slave trades. And so we see like at the time of this crusade and in the Black Sea, Cilicia, we have these two merchant cities of Italy, Genoa and Venice opening up slave trading ports in the Black Sea and nothing much has changed today with Ukraine and the slave trading that's going on there and the thieving of billions of dollars from the West for this ridiculous fake war that's to promote big Israel, the war that we're having now with Israel, uh, with its alternative agendas. So what does this have in common with Charles III and the origin of their family? Well, you know, we kind of see similar symbology on this World Economic Forum picture of Charles. We have the fleur de lis that was held by Leo I, and we have the king, the pearl of the Mediterranean, Cilician Armenia at the crossroads of east-west trade. 
In 1045, the Bagradit Armenian kingdom ceased to exist. This secular kingdom had been the gravitational center uniting Armenians, forming a centralizing pro-state movement. However, when the state system collapsed, it led to a political, economic, and cultural crisis. As a result, the pro-state counterweight to centrifugal forces lost its effectiveness. Armenians began to emigrate en masse from the Armenian highlands in two main directions, Cilicia and Crimea. Armenia had a large class of merchants and artisans due to the fact that the capital, Ani, and other Armenian cities had become large centers of international trade during the Bagradit dynasty. When the kingdom fell, this class had to find a way to overcome new crises. Hence, those emigrating en masse, besides those from the nobility and ruling classes, were first and foremost merchants and artisans who were looking for new countries to continue developing their economic endeavors. For this, Cilicia had exceptional conditions. Armenians had been in Cilicia since the times of Tigranes the Great. Cilician lands are considered one of the most fertile in the world. Its fields can be harvested twice a year. Meanwhile, Cilician highlands offer ample space for grazing livestock. The long Mediterranean beaches only add to Cilician beauty. By 1070, Armenian principalities started to form in Cilicia, the most prominent of which was the Rubenid Noble House, founded by the name after Prince Ruben in 1080 to 1095. The Rubenids became the foundation for the new Cilician Armenian state. Leo I was the son of Stephen of Armenia. Stephen was the son of Leo I, Lord of Armenia, Cilicia. In fab pedigree, we've got Leo the first Rubenid, Prince of Armenia. So they were Ruben, Rubenids. His father was Constantine the first, King of Armenia. Great grandfather, Rupin, first great king of Armenia. The Armenian Queens of Jerusalem. And it goes on to say here, it's no secret that the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia was instrumental for the Crusades. The Crusaders were welcomed in Armenia perhaps more than in any other place at the time. Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, in his Ecclesia Romana attested to this by writing among the good deeds which the Armenian people has done towards the church and the Christian world, it should especially be stressed that in those times when the Christian princes and the warriors went to retake the Holy Land, no people or nation with the same enthusiasm, joy and faith came to their aid as the Armenians did, who supplied the Crusaders with horses, provision and guidance. The Armenians assisted these warriors with their utter courage and loyalty during the Holy Wars. However, even more fascinating is the fact that during the 200 years of the existence of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, most of the queens from the kingdom were of Armenian descent. In fact, all of the five reigning queens and four out of the six queen consort wives of the kings of Jerusalem had Armenian ancestry, either fully or in part. Many of them were highly influential in the country's history, having ruled as regents for their minor children and heirs, as well as having great influence over their spouses. Let's examine them in more detail. Ada was the daughter of a Median noble named Tathul or Thoros, the lord of Marash, the first queen consort of Jerusalem from 1100 to 1105 AD. Her name was unrecorded in contemporary sources, but since the 17th century, she has been traditionally called Ada. She married Baldwin of Bologna, one of the leaders of the First Crusade, who by the aid of her father became the first Count of Edessa, Armenian Urua Urfa, a Crusader state carved out of Armenian territory in Mesopotamia. When Crusaders first conquered Jerusalem under leadership of Godfrey of Bulin, his brother Baldwin became the first king of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and thus Arda became the first queen consort of Jerusalem. Morphia of Melitane. Morphia was the daughter of an Armenian prince named Gabriel or Koril in Armenian, the ruler of the city of Melitene. She married a crusader knight Baldwin II who became the Count of Edessa after 1100. Baldwin and Morphia had four daughters, Melisende, Alice, Hoderna and 
Yoveta. The family lived in Edessa until 1118 when her spouse was elected as king of Jerusalem as successor of his cousin Baldwin I. It is said that Baldwin deeply loved his wife Morphia and as a mark of his love for his wife Baldwin II had postponed his coronation until Christmas Day 1119 so that Morphia and his daughters could travel to Jerusalem and so that Morphia could be crowned alongside him as his queen. So Melisande, queen of Jerusalem, was the eldest daughter of the above-mentioned Armenian princess Morphia of Malatane and Baldwin II of Jerusalem. She was named after her paternal grandmother Melisande of Montaleri, wife of Hugh the first Count of Rethel. As mentioned above, she had three younger sisters, Alice, Prince of Antioch. So Melisande married Falk V, Count of Anjou and Maine, an renownedly rich crusader and military commander. According to some historians, Falk's wealth connections and influence made him as powerful as the King of France at the time. Melisande and Falk had a son together in 1130, the future heir, Baldwin III, Falk's power and wealth made Baldwin II, the father of Melisande, slightly wary about the future of his heir and he made sure that Melisande would rule after him as reigning queen of Jerusalem. On a fab pedigree we have Melisande. It says, Queen of Jerusalem, said to be heiress to Nassai branch of the Davidic dynasty, passing this heirship to her stepson, Geoffrey Plantagenet. So she's an ancestor of the Plantagenet royal line of England, which is like King Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Remember in the past I've spoken about Melusine. Uh, is um, a figure of European folklore, a female spirit of fresh water in a holy well or river. She's usually depicted as a woman who is a serpent or a fish from the waist down, much like a lamia or a mermaid. So we have a serpent woman or a dragon woman. She has two tails. She is the image that's on the Starbucks coffee logo. And here we have the demon countess of Anjou. Now, ironically, this Melisande is married to Falk V, Count of Anjou. Through century-long rulers of England's throne, the family known as Plantagenet had its beginnings in France with Count Geoffrey of Anjou, who by wearing a sprig of yellow broom blossom, Planta Genista, in his hat or helmet, became known as Geoffrey Plantagenet, Genet being the French word for Planta Genista. Geoffrey married Empress Matilda, daughter of King Henry I, and in turn their son became Henry II of England when Matilda's cousin Stephen died, thus creating the House of Plantagenet and firmly fixing it to the English throne, Henry II of England and his children. The House of Anjou or Anjouvians were a family of Frankish origin descended from a 9th century noble name, Ingela, who were Counts of Anjou since 870. The Angevin monarchs also never shied away from their supposedly supernatural origins, said to have been descended from a demon. Even King Richard the Lionheart was reputedly fond of saying that his whole family came from the devil and would return to the devil as a result of their connection to demon Countess of Anjou. So who was the Countess? Well, as always, with legends there is more than one version, but all of them contain beautiful woman named Malacene. One story gives Melusine's background, the tale beginning with her mother, Prasine. It was in the time of crusade when Alanus, king of the Alba, Scotland, went hunting one day and came across a beautiful lady in the forest. Alanus fell in love instantly and persuaded Prasine to marry him, but she only agreed on the promise, for there is often a hard and fatal condition attached to the pairing of any mortal to fae creature, that he must not enter the herd chamber when she birthed or bathed her children. He agreed and she eventually gave birth to triplets but when he forgot his vow and entered her chamber while she was bathing, Priscine left the kingdom with her three daughters and went to the lost isle of Avalon. Now this is all mythology obviously but can we see this connection here? The next version comes 
the Count of Anjou as Black Fulk. Well, yet another name, his father Geoffrey Greymantle, but legend differs as to where Falk met Melisene. Some say that it was in a forest whilst out hunting, others trace it to the Crusades in the Holy Lands. Regardless, he returned to Anjou having married a beautiful Moorish girl. Well, I don't think she was Moorish, she was actually Armenian. It is said the wicked temper and high vaulting ambi ambition of Melisene's true father, he being the devil and not Alanus was passed down through the generation inherited by the Count of Anjou and subsequently the Plantagenet kings. Remember that Black Prince, son of Edward III, was known to possess a temper and some said it only flared once he stepped upon the French soil. Let's not forget that the Plantagenet hair colour was red, Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, so we have the red Welsh dragon. And Esau being red, red-haired. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, connection here with Melusine and Melisande. And it's kind of weird that they're saying she's this devil or serpent woman, dragon woman. We've got Folk here in the House of Anjou, Morphia of Armenia, Constantine the First, King of Armenia. He was a Rubenid, Beatrice of Rupenid or Rubenid, Rupen the First, King of Armenia. Now the Rupens go back to the Bagratuni. So Sibella, Queen of Jerusalem, was the daughter of above mentioned King Amric the First of Jerusalem and the first wife above mentioned Agnes of Courtenay. Thus, her Armenian ancestry is traced both through her parental lineage through Almeric and uh, the grandson of the Armenian princess Morphia and Melitene and her maternal lineage through Agnes of Courtenay and grandfather of the Armenian princess Beatrice of Armenia. Sibylla married William Longsworth of Montferrat, eldest son of Marquis William V of Montferrat and a cousin of Louis the Seventh of France and Frederick Barbarossa. William died the following year leaving Sibylla pregnant in the tradition of the dynasty, Sibylla named her son Baldwin. Sibylla did not remarry until 1180 when she married Guy of Lusignon. Sibylla bore Guy two daughters, Alice and Maria. So we can see how these Armenian royalties married into European royalty of France. And I think we can see where the French royalty got their use of the fleur de lis from because we see. Leo of Armenia with a fleur de lis, and now we see the French royalty using that as well. So, going back to trading in Armenia and Cilicia, Venetian and Genoese merchants had their own neighborhoods in cities of Cilicia and Armenia, including consulates, churches, courthouses, bathhouses, warehouses, etc. The most Progressive technologies of trade of the time were actively used in Cilicia. The spread of paper in the Mediterranean had changed the nature of trade. Any merchant could sail from AS with only a promissory note or receive it without any hard money or any other Mediterranean city such as Barcelona. There he could present the recipient, receive goods and sell back to AS and sell them. This ensured merchants against theft and pirates. All transitions took place through notary agencies. Many Genoese and Venetian notary agents had established themselves in Cilician Armenia. The documents they prepared, which sometimes could weigh several kilos, reached Italian cities despite the limited capacity of medieval ships. These papers are kept in archives to this day. Hundreds of merchants and other professionals from Genoa, Venice, southern France, and Catalonia are included in those notary transitions. Many of them even settled in Cilicia, Armenia and married Armenians. So this all ties us back to Genoa and Venice and banking. And this is kind of interesting because I believe there is this Edomite aristocracy or pharisaical Edomite aristocracy that's been ruling our, our world for, well, since before the Crusades. 
And I don't believe that the aristocracy that ruled Europe are actually European people or no longer are. I think we have two factions. We have an Edomite pharisaical, uh, what we know as Jewish banking elite that have come from Rome. And they are the black nobility and aristocracy that we know have ruled Europe, the Holy Roman Empire, and have basically supplied us with all of our popes and the Roman Catholic Church, which everything appears to come out of this particular region. And what's really interesting is that the Bible tells us that this is where Satan's seat is. Now, if you've listened to my videos, I've mentioned this before, and I know Pergamon is not particularly uh, Cilicia or Armenia, but it's uh, in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. It says, uh, Revelation 2, verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things say he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, my work has shown that I believe the dragon is the Herod family or King Herod and the heads belong to the Herod kings and there were seven heads, seven Herod kings who ruled throughout Judea, Cilicia, Armenia and Pergamon. If we go back to Herod Polio of Chalcis and he's said to be the relative of Vespasian. Uh, he has a daughter, Julia of Chalcis, or Chalcis, never get that right. Um, she has a child, Alexander I of Cilicia. Alexander of Cilicia has a daughter, Julia of Cilicia, and she has a daughter, Julia Quadrutilla Bassus. Who has a son, Aulus, Elias, Claudius, Carax. And here we have Aulus, Claudius, Carax of Pergamon, was a Roman citizen, military commander, politician, priest, philosopher, and historian during the reign of Emperors Hadrian and Antonius Pius. His full name may have been Aulus, Julius, Tiberius, Claudius, Carax. He was known to scholars for centuries simply as Carax of Pergamon. His maternal grandfather was Gaius Julius Quadratus Bassus, a Roman Galatian born in Pergamon. He was a Herod. He was legate of Judea, 102 to 103, 104 to 105, sufficient consul of Asia in 105 AD, governor of Cappadocia and Galatia, governor of Syria, Anyway, my point is is that we have this line of Herods in Pergamon. Is this where the seat of the dragon ended up? Is the Bible trying to tell us here that Satan's seat is in Pergamon because the Herod family line has ended up here or that at this particular time there were Herods, kings in this area? And their power was at this time in Pergamon. If I get back to banking, we've got the Pierre Leone family from Rome. And the Pierre Leone family were the force behind Pope Urban who called for the original crusade to take back the Holy Land. Leading family of the Roman nobility in the 11th and 12th centuries immediately and consistently associated with the papacy during the Gregorian reform. It, its earliest known representative was Roman Jew Baroche, whom the sources call Benedictus Christanus. After his conversion, he married a lady of the Roman aristocracy and died before 19. Uh, November 1910-51. His son Leo, an important figure by 1051, supported Hildebrand in every way. Last mentioned in 1062, he was succeeded by his son Pi Petrus Leonis, who gave the family its name. Their closeness to Hildebrand and notice in the Annalis Pegavanesis Monumenta Germanae Historia Scriptoris 
and other circumstantial evidence gave rise to the highly controversial theory that Gregory the Sixth and Gregory the Seventh were related to them. Urban the Second took refuge from the followers of the anti-pope Clement the Third on the Tiber Island, which was controlled by Petrus Leonis, and he died in Petrus Leonis fortified house near the church of S. Nicola in Castare, close to the theatre of Marcellus. Petronius Leonis remained a faithful supporter of Urban's successor, Fashal II, Galassius II, and Callistus II. He died between 1124 and 1130. His son Petrus, called like his father Petrus Leonis, was for a time a student in Paris and a monk at Cluny and was raised by Fashal II not later than 1113 to the rank of Cardinal Deacon by the Callistus II in 1120 to that of Cardinal Priest. The growing influence of Pierre Leone aroused the enmity of the other leading Roman family, the Frangipani, which is kind of weird because of, so we'll see later that they're more than likely related to the Frangipani. More important, under Honorius II, new forces opposed the older cardinals to the reform began to rise in the Sacred College under the leadership of Chancellor Americ of St. Maria. So we see the, the church is uh, infiltrated with this uh, banking elite or banking aristocracy who are Roman and what I believe to be Edom of Edomite origin. Later on we have the Khazarian uh, converts they come along, and I think that these Edomite version of, uh, well, they call themselves Jews or Israelites, but they're not. They're Edomite Pharisees, and they see the Khazarians as sort of a lesser, in more inferior version, and they kind of use them in their class system. You know, they were happy to kill them off in the Second World War to gain their agenda, which is you know, a new crusade to claim the Holy Land. In all these world wars we've been having, the First, Second World War has all been pretty much a modern crusade for regaining this land. And, you know, this war that we're experiencing at the moment is all part of that agenda to unite the Ukraine, the Khazarian lands, and to re-instigate this old trading route of the Silk Road and the new Belt and Road project, which I believe is a new economy and a whole new world order basically based on the old Silk Road system. Uh, it says the Pierre Leone family, meaning sons of Peter Leo, was a great aristocratic family of medieval Rome based in a tower house in Trastevere where many Roman Jews lived. In the early days, the head of the family often bore the title of Consul Roma Norm, that is, Consul of the Romans. The family is descended from 11th century Jewish convert Leo de Benedict, whose baptismal name derives from the fact that he was baptized by Pope Leo the IX himself. They were also bankers and financially supported the reformed papacy. The Pierre Leone, in all their greatness, falsely claimed to be descendants from the ancient Roman aristocracy of, Aniki, uh, of the Aniki family. But the enemies in Rome valued the exploitation of the Jews and the usual sin of usury was levied. Leo's son was named Pietro Leo, Pierre Leone, and his sons who brought fame to the house of as papal protectors. Uh, so I found this book on um, Google Books, uh, and it says the Pierre Leone family, during this period when the Counts of Tusculum and the Crescenzi family ruled Rome and pushed their candidates onto the papal throne. There emerged another rival Roman families who were to share in the Pope making process. The next centuries were to see the rise of the Savelli, Catani, Frangipani, and the Pier Leone families. Sometimes they were locked together as allies and often they fought against one another. Some of these families provided members who Attain their hierarchical position of supreme pontiff. Others, like the Frangipani, became the power behind the election of candidates for the papal throne. Certainly, the Pierre Leones were without parallel in the history of the papacy. 
They were descended from Borsch, a Jewish banker who, with his son Leone, Leo, converted to the Roman Catholic Church. When baptized, he took the name Benedictus Christanus. The Pierleoni family were the bankers and financial advisors of numerous popes. Borsch was probably married to a member of the Frangipani family and apparently had another son, Giovanni Graziano, a translation of the Jewish name Yocanan. Giovanni Graziano had become a priest and served as a, at the monastery of St. Mary on the Aventine and as archpriest of St. John of the Latin Gate. As a member of the distinguished Pialetti family, he would have been acquainted with the Roman aristocracy. He was the godfather of the profilgate Pope Benedict the Ninth, who served as Pope on three different occasions. Gregory was sent to Germany accompanied by his chaplain Hildebrand, who was a Pierre Leone or otherwise related to the deposed pontiff. One source comes to the conclusion that Hildebrand was the son of Leo, brother of Giovanni Graziono, while others believe him to be the son of Leo's wife's sister and thus a nephew of by marriage. What is known is that Hildebrand was very close to Graziano, whose great wealth and bequeathed to Hildebrand upon his death. Graziano's genealogy is somewhat in dispute. Another source places him in the Stefanaschi family. Duke Hildebrand of the Stefanaschi had a son, Hildebrand, a monk whose son became Pope Benedict VI. He wore the papal mitre for a short time from 973 to 974 and was, was murdered. The monk Hildebrand had a sister, Constantia, wife of Duke Gregory. Their son, Gratianus, husband of Theodora, was the father of Pope Gregory the Sixth, uh, Giovanni Graziano. There is some confusion here as Theodora, daughter of Senator Teofilato, is listed in other sources as his wife of Consul Gratianus. And because Theodora and Gratianus' daughter married into the Crescenzi family, the maker and breaker of popes, it is even possible that the Stefanesci and Pialioni are part of the same family. What is known for sure is that the Stefanesci were cousins to the Crescenzi, Alberici, Savelli, Annabaldi, Conti, and Paparici, Pope Innocent II, born Gregorio Paparici, belonged to the family. So we've got these Jewish banking families that are all interlinked with the popes. There is no doubt that the Roman or Lazio families such as Orsini, Colonia, Savelli, Gattini, Frangipani, Pierleoni, Crescenzi and Stefanici were related by common ancestors and intermarriage. The Pierleoni and Frangipani families were related both being of the ancient Latin genus Anisi, Anisia, Augusta. The Frangipani may indeed have been descended from the Pierleoni, the Conti, and in turn the Colonia family, which is believed to have been directly descended from the Tusculum Conti or the Alberici families. So we've got all these black nobility families, papal families, are also of the Latin genus Anisia. Zazera, in the, his history of the Conti family, says that they were of the Roman house of Augusta. Ottavia, the Crescenzi married into prominent families like the Gratani, Crescenzo, Gaetani, descended from both the Crescenzi, Gaetani was the father of Gaetana, wife of Orso, Orsini, and his grandchildren, including Giacoma, wife of Pietro di Pier, Pierleoni, Margreta, wife of Odone, Colonia, and Matteo Rosso Ossini, father of Pope Nicholas III. Sorry about butchering all these names. So, yeah, we've got all these uh, black nobility families that are all tied in with popes and the Crusades for the Holy Land. So, if we go to Wikipedia, we've got the genus 
Anicia or Anisi was a plebeian family at ancient Rome mentioned first towards the end of the 4th century BC. The first of the Anisi to achieve prominence under the Republic was Lucius Anicius Gallus who conducted the war against the Illyrians during the Third Macedonian War. A noble family bore his, uh, this name in the imperial era and may have been descended from the Anisi of the Republic. You know, they claim that they're from this family. Some sources say that it was wrong that they claimed they're from this family, but, you know, here we have this book saying otherwise. So members of the Anisi family line, um, you know, we've got some early members. Uh, we have one guy here, Quintus Anisius Faustus. Let's look at him with fab pedigree. Quintus Anicius Faustus Paulinus, and he's a Herod. So when we go back to his lineage here, Quadratus Bassus, Alexander of Cilicia, and we've got this Herod king, Judea. And this is the same line that I showed before that was from the Pergamon family of Herods. So... You know, if the Pierre Leonia family are saying they're related to this Anicius or an Anicius uh, line, then they're Herods. They're related to the Edomite uh, Pharisaical line, uh, kings of Judea. I just want to read an article here. Um, someone's written written from. The University of Queensland, Australia, Herodian Marriage and the Construction of Identity by James Windsor Donald, BA, BA Honours, MA Queensland. Um, so we'll go down to where I was. And, you know, he's written here about the um, the family of Herod. Uh, Salome I, she was the sister of, of King Herod and uh, she was... Uh, more on the Nabataean side. Uh, so let me one and identify a more or less invisible fragment of the family who retain their Jewish roots while serving as private citizens. In the same spirit of marriage with Jewish uh, economic elites and within the royal family that Herod the first, first triumphed in the first century BCE, Mariamne, the fifth marriage to Julius Archelaus thus becomes a clear indication that Agrippa I continued to recognize the importance of articulating the family as controllers of not just the religious and royal power of, in Judea and associated areas, but also its role in forging strong and effective links to powerful families of the economic elite. This marriage is just one example of the broader continuance of the interfamilial marriage policy of the Judean Herodians. Additional examples may also be found in the cases of Agrippa I marriage to Cyprus III, Herod's the fourth two marriages, and also the marriage of his eldest son, Aristobulus VI. This Aristobulus VI was the son of Herod IV of Chalcis and Mariamne IV, his first wife and married Salome III, the daughter of Herod II and Herodias. She had previously been married to Philip the Tetrarch, meaning that this marriage draws on multiple constructions of identity in the family past, opening up considerable options for him in the expressing of his identity in the mid to late 1st century CE. In her father's line, Salome III could claim descent from high priests and kings, and on her mother's side could claim descent from Hasmonean kings and high priests. Through this very ad advantageous marriage, Aristobulus VI eventually received the monarchy of Armenia Minor in 54 CE or AD um, rather than current era. So this, this is Armenia Lesser, which is basically around the area of Cilicia and, and uh, where all these Armenian kings are. An appointment that can directly be attributed to his descent from a wide variety of influential Jewish figures Although his neighbour in Greater Armenia was a distant cousin, Tigranus I, it would be wrong to assume that these two families had much in common. Instead, the placement of Aristobulus VI should be seen in terms of him being one of a multitude of possible choices to rule this troublesome region, drawing on the prestige of many Eastern dynasties 
as evidence of this difference a of family identity. Aristobulus VI inherited the right to appoint the Jewish high priest and control over their robes in 48 AD on the death of his father Herod the Fourth of Chals Chalcis. Chalcis. Herod the Fourth claimed descent from the Hasmoneans, but Aristobulus the Sixth marriage had strengthened his claim to this important post in that he was also married to a descendant of a Simon Boethius, another high priest. Therefore, Aristobulus the Sixth must have retained a strong religious identity drawing on his lineage from high priests and from kings despite his northern appointment. Again, this contrasts strongly with the abandonment of Jewish identity by the Armenian branch of the family. At the same time as his appointment to Lesser Armenia, Agrippa II, his cousin, was appointed to the rule of Chalcis and several surrounding regions by Nero in the period leading up to Jewish revolt. Now, it goes on to say that Salome had, and he had, three sons. Now, in history, there's no more mention of these three sons. They just disappear off the face of um, the planet, basically. Their line is considered extinct. I beg to differ. If we check out their fab pedigree page, we've got Aristobulus of Judea. He's the son of Herod Polio, king of Chalcis. This is the line that supposedly Vespasian is a, a pseudo Herod under. And we've got Salome of Judea, children Agrippa of Judea, Alexander of Asmonea, Asmonea, uh, or Alexandra. And there's said to be a third son uh, named Herod as well. So Agrippa of Judea, no continuation of his family line, no children. And Alexandra, possible child, Seamus of Ituria. So Alexandra is actually a girl. Anyway, at, so basically on Fab Pedigree, there's two sons missing. Princess of Ituria, King Priest of Emesa. So I think this line marries into uh, another Herod line. Yep. King Priest of Emesa who marries Priestess Queen of Emesa, Herod. Uh, yep. And she's another Herod up here. Judea, Herod, king of, yep. So they're just continually remarrying into Herod lines, into their own family lines. And from what appears to be uh, then marrying into Roman aristocracy or just uh, basically becoming the Jewish banking families of Rome. Uh, these banking families are intertwined with Genoa and Venice and these trading ports and the Crusades. So, and the story just goes on and on. So claim of the biblical descent of the Bagrationi dynasty. The legend that Georgian royal Bagrationi dynasty were of a Hebrew origin and descended from David dates back to the family's appearance on the Georgian soil in the later half of the 8th century. As Bagratid power grew, this claim morphed into an officially endorsed paradigm enshrined in medieval history, historical literature such as the early 11th century chronicle of Sambat Davidus Z and formed the basis of the dynasty political ideology for the duration of the uh, the millennium long ascendancy in Georgia. The proposed Davidic descent allowed the Bagrationi to claim kingship with Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary and the rest and rest their legitimacy on the biblical archetype of the God anointed royalty. Now, who tries to claim the, the throne of Jesus? You know, we know that the Antichrist and the dragon people do. You know, we've got um, this Melisande, Melisene, uh, this serpent woman who, um, or dragon woman. We've got 
St. George slaying the dragon in Georgia. And we've had, you know, basically we've got all this dragon mythology related to uh, Judean royalty and the Armenian Georgian sort of royalty. And then we've got uh, the all these Herods up in this region. The legend of the Bagrationis, Hebrew or Divinic descent is given no credence by modern mainstream scholarship. The family's origin is disputed, but the view formulated by the historians such as Takashivi and Cyril Turmanov that the uh, Georgian dynasty descended from a refugee prince of the Armenian house of Bagratuni prevails. Well, you know, like, is it possible that these three sons of Salome III and Aristobulus the Herods and their claim that they have family relatives to the throne of Judea and the Hasmonean royal family, the high priests. Is this where this story is coming from? So the legend originated in the Armenian Georgia milieu in the later half of the 8th century. A Hebrew province is first ascribed to the Armenian Bagratuni by the early medieval Armenian historian Moses Krenazi, but he is no way suggests that the family descended from King David around 800. The early Georgian Bagratids creatively manipulated the claim so as to present themselves as the direct biological descendants of the biblical king. They did not explicitly apply a Davidic origin to their Armenian cousins, although Armenians subsequently adopted the Georgians' innovation as their own. So where's the story come from? The first Armenian source familiar with the Davidic origin of the Bagratids is the history of Armenia by the early 10th century historian Havanis Drashanekertsi, who would have been exposed to the Georgian legend while voluntarily residing at the court of the Georgian Bagratid ruler Ada Nasi IV, who died in 923. In general, the Armenian Bagratids displayed little interest in the Hebrew theory and its Davidic development as compared with the Georgian counterparts. Uh, the earliest extant native reference to the Georgian Bagratids and the Davidic clamoring is found in Pseudo Jansh's brief historical work written between 800 and 813. Where is related the arrival of Kartil, a core Georgian region, sometimes after 772, of Adonesi, who was the house of David the prophet. The legend became well known enough to feature in the 45th chapter of the Treatise de Administrando Imperio, written in 950 by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Seventh, whom he claimed apparently reached through. The Caucasus serving at the imperial court of Constantinople. According to Constantine, the Georgians believed they were scions of Uriah's wife Bathsheba, with whom King David committed adultery, and who had children by him. Thus they claimed to have been related to the Virgin Mary, inasmuch as she was also descended from David. I believe it's probably come more from these Herodian kings of Armenia, Mimia Lessa, Cilicia, who claim the right to the throne of Judea and the temple also. And now you've got to ask yourself the question, where did the legend of St. George come from? Georgia all the way to England, and specifically Wales. So we've got this uh, St. George slaying the dragon in Wales, the Welsh dragon, and We've got the Prince of Wales, you know, the Prince of Wales coat of arms. So we've got the Welsh dragon down here, uh, the Fleur de Lis, uh, which was on the King Leo's coin, the Fleur de Lis, the Welsh dragon, the lion, which was on the coin as well, the Armenian story, uh, Georgian story about dragons and we've got the St. George cross all over the English flag. Yeah, so then we have the Plantagenet story with the Malasane, the the dragon woman uh Malasande from Armenia and the House of Plantagenet 
Here they have the rose, the war of the roses, the rose of uh, Rhodes, perhaps, that I've mentioned before, the fleur de lis. You know, maybe they come from these uh, trading families through Rhodes to Armenia, the, the trading families, the Black Sea. You know, they were related to the families of Anjou, which is Melisande married into. You know, they were the kings of Jerusalem, the Crusades. So expansion in Britain. On his extension, Edward I sought to organise his realm, enforcing his claim to primacy in the British Isles. Llewellyn ap Gruford claimed to rule North Wales, entirely separated from England, but Edward viewed him to be a rebel and a disturber of the peace. Edward's determination, military experience and skilful naval manoeuvres ended what was to him rebellion. The invasion was executed by one of the largest armies ever assembled by an English king, comprising Anglo-Norman cavalry and Welsh archers and laying the foundation for future victories in France. Llewellyn was driven into the mountains later, dying in battle. The statue of Rudland established England's authority over Wales. And Edward's son was proclaimed the first English Prince of Wales. In Harold G. St. George's Cross, the Cross of St. George is a red cross on a white background which from late Middle Ages became associated with St. George, a military saint often depicted as a crusader. Associated with the Crusades on a red and white cross, it has its origins in the 10th century and has been used to ensign the Republic of Genoa from perhaps as early as the 10th century. So Genoa, we remember the training ports in Cilicia, so George became associated with the patron saint of England in the 14th century, placing St. Edmund the Martyr. Since then, the flag is commonly identified as the national flag of England. St. George is the patron saint of the Spanish semi-autonomous region of Catalonia and of the country of Georgia. It figures in the emblem crest of FC Barcelona. St. George became widely venerated as the warrior saint during the Third Crusade, where the legend that he had miraculously assisted Godfrey of Bullion, also that Richard the Lionheart had placed himself under the protection. So, you know, we've got all these crusaders sort of stuff coming through, uh, you know, and these crusader kings of Jerusalem marrying Armenian women. And then we have these Plantagen families becoming the first princes of Wales. So we have an article here, who are the black nobility? The black nobility were uh, the oligarch families of Venice and Genoa, Italy, who in the 12th century held the privileged trading rights monopolies. The first of three crusades from 1063 to 1123 established the power of the Venetian black nobility and solidified the power of the wealthy ruling class. The black nobility aristocracy achieved complete control over Venice in 1171 when the appointment of the Dogue was transferred to what was known as the Great Council, which consisted of members of the commercial aristocracy, among them the infamous de' Medici family. Venice has remained in their hands ever since, but the power of influence of the Venetian black nobility extends far beyond its borders and today it is felt in every corner of the globe. Don't forget our modern banking system originated in Italy. In 1204, the oligarch family parceled out feudal enclaves to their members and from this epoch dates the great building up of power and pressure until the government became a closed corporation. Of the leading black nobility families, more of this can be found in the works of Dr. John Coleman, Black Nobility Unmasked Worldwide, 1985, Conspirators Hierarchy, the story of the Committee of 300, 1992. The black nobility earned its title through dirty tricks, so when the population revolted against the monopolies in government as anywhere else, the leaders of the uprising were quickly seized and brutally hanged. The black nobility uses secret assassinations, murder, blackmail and bankrupting of opposing citizens or companies, kidnapping, rape and so on, hence their name. Who are these families? Well, the most important ones are House of Bernadotti in Sweden, House of Bourbon, France, House of Braganza, Portugal, House of Grimaldi, Monaco, 
House of Guelph, Britain, the most important one, House of Habsburg, Austria, House of Hanover, Germany, second most important one, House of Hohenzollern, Germany, House of Karajordovic, Yugoslavia, House of Liechtenstein, House of Nassau, Luxembourg, House of Oldenburg, Denmark, House of Orange, Netherlands, House of Savoy, Italy, House of Wetton, Belgium, House of Wittelsbach, Germany, House of Wittenberg, Germany, House of Zogu, Albania, all the families you will find on the Windsor family tree. And all of these families are foreign people ruling over us. They're not from our family. Which, as the Bible said, if we were to have kings or aristocracy over us, they were to be brothers and family members. All the families listed are connected with the House of Guelph, one of the original black nobility families of Venice, from which the House of Windsor and thus the present Queen of England, Elizabeth II, well, she's not present anymore, it's her son, Charles. The Guelphs are so intertwined with the German aristocracy through the House of Hanover that it would take several pages to mention all their connections. All, or most European royal houses, originate from the House of Hanover and thus from the House of Guelph, the black nobility. An example, the Hanoverian British King George I came from the Duchy of Lundberg, a part of northern Germany which had been governed by Guelph family since the 12th century. Today the Guelphs, the Windsors, rule by dominating the raw materials market and for years they have fixed the price of gold, a commodity they neither produce nor own. The House of Windsor also controls the price of copper, zinc, lead and tin. It is no accident that the principal commodity exchanges are located in London, England. Companies run by black nobility families are British Petroleum, Oppenheimer, Lonro, Philbro and many, many more. Another black nobility family is the Grosvenors of England. For centuries this family lived as most of the European families on the ground rent. Today the family owns at least 300 acres of land in the centre of London. The land is never sold but leased on a 39 year leasehold agreement. The ground rent of the Middle Ages. Grosvenor Square on which the American Embassy is located belongs to the Grosvenor family as does Eaton Square. The Eaton Square apartments are rented out at 25,000 to 75,000 pounds a month and that does not include maintenance costs. This is to give you an idea of the immense wealth that black nobility families garner from ground rents and why families like the Windsors are not at all interested in industrial progress along with the excess population it supports. This is the main reason why these noble families are behind most, if not all, the wrong-headed pro-environmental movements of the world that ultimately and covertly, of course, aim to curb population growth. Prince Philip and Prince Charles are the most visible symbols of these movements and both have often spoken with the utmost callousness about the need to rid the world of unwanted people. The black nobility are founders of the modern secret societies of our day from which all the others that are connected to the Illuminati originated from the Committee of 300, the Club of Rome, the CFR, the RIIA, the Bilderbergs, the Round Table, all originated from the Committee of 300 and therefore from the European black nobility families. Cooperating with European black nobility are American families like the Harrimans and the McGeorge Bundys. The House of Hanover seems to be German but is really Jewish, so is the House of Habsburg. So it wasn't really the Germans that took over the British throne. Now what's really interesting is that, you know, the round table, and this ties into Arthurian legend as well. The father of King Arthur was Uther Pendragon, legendary English ruler and according to the med medieval historian Geoffrey of Monmouth, the father of King Arthur. There is no proof that Uther Pendragon really existed, though scholars believe he may have lived sometime during the mid 400s to 500s AD. According to Momin's account, Uther and his older brother Aurelianus Ambrosius vanquished Vortigern, the treacherous high king of England, and Ambrosius took the throne. Ambrosius then sent Uther along with the magician Merlin to Ireland to pick up the healing stones that were to become Stonehenge. Now, Geoffrey of Monmouth was, uh, a lot of his work was very fictional, but they believe that the Arthurian legend is based on some fact and that Uther was actually a Roman general of some kind uh, related to the dragon battalion. 
but you know i'm wondering if he's really related to the dragon family bloodline not long after Ambrosius died, poisoned by Saxon Merlin, witnessing a spectacular vision in the sky, a fiery dragon and a shooting star at the time of Ambrosius' death prophesied that Uther, who should now be called Pendragon, would father a great king who would be England's salvation. Who is King Arthur Pendragon? Was he a real king? So, according to Arthurian legend, Uther was the youngest son of King Constantine III and as I found, Emperor Constantine was related to these Roman bloodlines that were related to Herod's. His elder brother Constans succeeded their father after his death but was killed when their advisor Vortigern turned against them. Uther and his older brother Aurelius Ambrosius had to flee to Britannia where they were still children. Years later they returned to reclaim the throne. Vortigern was killed by Aurelius who then became the king. So while the legends of King Arthur and other characters in the story are well known, there is no concrete evidence that proves the existence of these characters. Historians are divided in their view of the legends, with most leaning towards them being of the figment of a storyteller's imagination. However, there are others who believe that King Uther Pendragon was in fact a real person and the obscurity around him increased after he was associated with fantasies and fairy tales. The best known mention of Uther comes from Geoffrey of Mormont's Historia Regium Britanniae. His family is also based on historical figures like Constantine III, who was a real ruler at the beginning of the 5th century. His son was named Constans. There is also a figure by the name of Ambrosius Aurelianus, but no clear connection is established between him and Constantine. Before Geoffrey's work, Uther's name can also be found in the Welsh poems, some of which date back to the 6th century. The lack of more information written or otherwise is also attributed to the Dark Ages where most stories were handed down verbally rather than having been kept in written records. This provides shaky facts to historians but also opens the doors of several possibilities that the storytellers have used to their purpose over the years. The name Pendragon has also been associated with Pendragon Castle at Malastang which according to the legend was founded by King Uther. In 2016, the Independent reported an archaeological find of a royal palace at Tintagel in Cornwall. It is believed to date back to the 6th century, which interestingly brings it to the same timeline as Arthurian legends. According to the stories, it was here that Uther and Igraine conceived Arthur. Though it doesn't exactly prove the legends were real, after all, it does provide something for the supporters of legends to latch onto. The quest for the Holy Grail, uncovering the mystery of its importance to knights. The Holy Grail is one of the most famous and enduring legends of medieval times. But what exactly is the Holy Grail and why is it so important to the Knights of the Round Table? The Holy Grail is a mythical object that has been described in many different ways over the years. In some stories it is said to be the cup that Jesus used during the Last Supper. In others it is a dish or platter. Some version of the legend suggests that the Grail is a magical stone or even a person. Despite the variations of the legend the holy grail is always associated with themes of purity spiritual enlightenment and divine power it is believed to be the symbol of ultimate spiritual quest and many people have sought it throughout history why is it important to knights in the legend of king arthur the knights of the round table the holy grail plays a central role the knights embark on a quest to find the grail which is said to have healing powers and the ability to grant eternal life the quest for the Grail is often depicted as the ultimate spiritual journey, a test of the knight's faith and worthiness. The knights believed that finding the Grail would bring them great honour and glory. It was also seen as a way to prove their loyalty to God and to their king. Many knights set out on a quest, but only a few were deemed worthy enough to see the Grail. In some versions, the legend of the Grail was only revealed to the purest and most virtuous of knights, while in others it was hidden away and could only be found those who were willing to risk everything in their quest. So they're saying that the Grail is a person and here we have the Priory of Sion, fraternal organisation founded in France in 1956 by Pierre Plantard. It was based on the site of the Byzantine Hagia Sion which subsequently housed a monistic order called the Abbey of Our Lady of Mount Zion. In 1960 Plantard began claiming that the Priory of Zion was a secret society founded by crusading knight 
Godfrey of Bullion in 1099 that it was engaged in centuries-long benevolent conspiracy to install a secret bloodline of the Merovingian dynasty on the thrones of France and the rest of Europe. The myth was popularized in the book The Sacred Enigma and the novel The Da Vinci Code. The Prior of Zion is also described as an itinerary order of chivalry and a Gnostic and Rosicrucian influence founded in Jerusalem in 1099 by Godfrey of Bullion. Another version of the Priory of Zion is the Priory de Zion Rectif, which is a spiritual order that illuminates truth found in New Testament and Gnostic Gospels. So it's said that this uh, Priory of Zion hides the genealogy of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. This bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene uh, is the historical legacy that has come down to us orally from now available to anyone. So we've got the Fleur de Lis here. So they're saying that this bloodline quite possibly may be this Armenian bloodline from the French royalty during the Crusades. I'm just wondering, is this why the British throne claimed that they are descendants of the throne of David? And all I can say is that David's enduring throne is fulfilled in Jesus, who is now the king of the kingdom of heaven and not of this earth. As I've said before in uh, some of my other videos, we have Steven Spielberg in the Indiana Jones trilogy, The Last Crusade, finding the Holy Grail in Petra. Now, if you look into my, my other research, we know that King Herod's family originates from Petra. He's not only Edomite by his father's side, he is a Nabataean via his mother's side. So uh, I'm just wondering if, if Spielberg is, is giving away a secret here that the Holy Grail or the, the bloodline, the dragon bloodline of King Arthur and his father Uther Pendragon is that of a Herod dragon back, background. So basically through Wales, the Welsh dragon, and so basically the royal dragon bloodline originates in Petra. And this is where the secret of the, the Grail leads us to the dragon bloodline of Uther Pendragon and his son King Arthur who ruled England and united England under the Knights of the Round Table and I believe uh, there's a lot of link to Wales, the dragon of Wales, the story of St George slaying the dragon comes from Georgia and Armenia and is also linked to the trading city of Genoa. Now we have this dragon bloodline ruling the United Kingdom. Also the royal family of the Nabataeans and the Nabataean spice trading merchants originate from the Nabataeans of Iraq and they link back to the rulers of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar who was referred to in the Old Testament as the dragon and they also worshipped the dragon Marduk. These people were the seed of the serpent and it adds a whole other meaning to what Jesus was calling the Pharisees as children of their father, the devil. Knights of the Round Table. The Winchester Round Table is a tabletop that was discovered in the Winchester Castle. The design of the table is in accordance with the legendary Round Table of King Arthur's Knights. The Winchester Table has the image of the king at one side and the names of the knights inscribed along the circumference of the table's top surface. According to historical research, the table was originally constructed sometime in the 13th century on the order of Edward I, so a Plantagenet king. The original round table was used by King Arthur in his court, according to Arthurian legends. There are many stories regarding the origins of the table. Some stories cite a quarrel between King Arthur's barons over the order of precedence. Accordingly, a carpenter proposed a solution and constructed a huge round table for the king which could seat up to 1,600 men. Another version of the legend says King Arthur himself had the table constructed because of the frequent quarrels of his barons. The construction of the table resolved the quarrels related to the order of precedence and leveled all disparities between the king's knights. According to Arthurian knights, the king regularly sat down with his knights around this table. The original round table of King Arthur's court eventually became one of the most notable knight orders of the king. Any knight who sat on the round table became the knight of the round table, a distinction which meant 
that he was among the most distinguished and esteemed knights in the king's realm. It was for these knights and the round table that many codes of chivalry existed which the knights were required to closely adhere. The Winchester Round Table was constructed a lot later than the legendary age of King Arthur. Edward I, the 13th century, took a lot of interest in Arthurian legends and aimed to revive certain chivalric aspects of the Arthurian age. To this end, he attended many round table tournaments and hosted at least one himself. The table is dated back sometime between 1250 and 1280. The construction of the Winchester Round Table is such that it has a total of 12 legs and seats, making room for a total of 25 people. Of these, one seat is meant for the king and the rest of the 24 seats are reserved for specific knights. Interesting, we have 24 elders, one king, Jesus. The names of the knights are inscribed along the circumference of the table so that each knight has a specific position assigned to him. The table itself is 18 feet across and 3 inches thick, weighing 1.25 tonnes. It is currently installed in the Great Hall of Winchester. And finally, I'd just like to show this particular Prince of Wales. King Charles III is a descendant of Dracula and owns properties in Transylvania. And, you know, I'm not going to go into whether Vlad the Impaler was related to these uh, Armenian royalty, but, you know, all these royal families are interbred, intermarried. And if Charles is uh, related to Vlad the Impaler, uh, the Order of the Dragon with the St. George Cross on it, the Society of the Dragon was a monarchical chivalric order only for selected higher aristocracy and monarchs. So, founded by Sigmund of Luxembourg, who was then the King of Hungary and, Cro uh, and Croatia, was particularly inspired from the Order of St. George of 1326. Another influential model may have been the Sicilian Order of the Ship. Uh, so, we've got St. George linked here again, a dragon and St. George's Cross. Uh, members, Vlad II, father of Vlad the Impaler, was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a militant fraternity founded by Sigismund of Luxembourg, King of Hungary. So, you know, um, all of this dragon information and these black nobility Italian families, the Holy Roman Empire, the Vatican, the Popes, they're all linked to these banking families which, you know, have declared themselves to be linked to these ancient Roman families which I've shown you are basically related to the Herods and this uh, Armenian royal family which claims uh, heritage to the throne of Judea and the throne of line of David, which the Herods also claimed, and they can claim that through marriage because King Herod I married uh, a Hasmonean princess and that's how they managed to claim that they are of the throne of David. And I believe that this is why the royal family of Britain and the you know, Commonwealth who think that they can own the world, that they are uh, ordained by God to rule over us and uh, basically in tikkun olam inherit the earth. Why do they want to inherit the earth? I, I find this desire amongst these people to inherit the earth and rule over everybody is such a strong desire, more than any people on this earth have. And I think it comes from their genetic link to Esau and his hatred of Jacob and the fact that he lost his inheritance as the eldest son to Jacob or he gave his inheritance away. And now it's been their obsession to try to claim it back and take their inheritance as the inheritors of the throne of David are basically Herods. I mean, I've found massive links here to uh, Herod genealogy and all of these orders that uh, claim themselves to be dragons or, uh, and I, I believe it's the seat of Satan. So we have the thrones of England, uh, you know, the king of England, the queen of England who's just passed, they claim themselves to be the head of the Church of England. So they're both king and priest of 
Protestantism, and they're also come under the Pope. So we've got this Pope that sits on a throne. Uh, he says he's a king priest as well. And so we have these two beasts, these, uh, you know, the beasts of the sea and the beasts of the earth, which are all run by the dragon. And as I've claimed through scripture that the dragon isn't some uh, spiritual being in some kind of uh, other realm in, in high places because if we're looking at the realm of heaven and the high places, there's no devil in God's kingdom of heaven. Uh, he's being cast to the earth. So if this is the case, how is the devil or Satan ruling from high places on this earth? He's not. He's bas it's basically people in high places. The high places were where uh, the aristocracy of antiquity sacrificed to their gods on high places, on hills, uh, the the kings and queens, the politics of the ancient world are exactly the same as the kings and queens and politics of the modern world. And we have this dragon family ruling over us, which is the seed of Satan, uh, as the Bible tells us. And the Herod family were the rulers of Pergamon at the time. So I think that it's pretty obvious from Revelation that King Herod was the dragon. It's showing us that this particular family and lineage is the dragon and that it's been ruling over us now for a few thousand years or however long our history is really since the Crusades, before the Crusades. And specifically, its little season is here. It's coming to an end soon. And the little season is when it has its full power to rule over us and control our lives. Uh, which it's doing now. And in this Middle East eye, King Charles III, five things the new British monarch said about Islam and Muslims. The king, who once studied Arabic to better understand the Quran, has long spoken about Islamic history and theology. In 1996, the Grand Mufti of Cyprus shockingly accused Charles III, the new British king, of secretly being a Muslim. Did you know that Prince Charles has converted to Islam? Yes, yes, he is a Muslim. I can't say more, but it happened in Turkey. Oh yes, he converted all right. The late Nazim al-Hakwani said, When you get home, check on how often he travels to Turkey. You'll find that your future king is a Muslim. Buckingham Palace simply re replied, Nonsense. Charles, who became the new monarch last week following the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, aged 96, is not a secret Muslim but has admiration and knowledge of the Islamic faith is well documented. The 73-year-old, who is now the head of the Church of England, has made several speeches whilst king in waiting on the theological and historical subject related to Muslims and Islam. He even once revealed that he has been learning Arabic in order to understand the Quran better. A fact praised by Cambridge Central Mosque Imam last week during a sermon. The Middle East Eye takes a look at some of Charles III's most significant references to Islam over the decades. The environment and the natural world. Charles has long advocated an environmental issue and climate change occasionally invoking Islamic theology on the subject. In 1996, speech entitled A Sense of the Sacred, Building Bridges Between Islam and the West, he suggested that the appreciation of Islamic views on natural order would help us in the West to rethink and for the better our practical stewardship of man and his environment. Charles elaborated on those views in 2010 speech at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, which he has been a patron of since 1993. From what I know of Islamic core teachings and commentaries, the important principle we must keep in mind is that there are limits to the abundance of nature, he said. So basically he's saying there's a limit to God and his ability to provide for his people and uh, to replenish the earth. These are not arbitrary limits. They are the limits imposed by God and as such, if my understanding of the Quran is correct, Muslims are commanded not to transgress them. He later describes Islam as possessing one of the greatest treasuries of accumulated wisdom and spiritual knowledge available to humanity, a tradition he said was obscured by a drive towards Western materialism. 
a rich opinion from a man who wants for nothing and basically owns most of the world's wealth can't even wipe his own ass. The inconvenient truth is that we share this planet with the rest of creation for a very good reason and that is we cannot exist on our own without intricately balanced web of life around us. Islam has always taught this and to ignore that lesson is to default on our contract with creation. He went on to mention examples of Islamic urban planning through the centuries including irrigation systems in Spain uh, 1200 years ago as examples of how prophetic teaching maintained long-term resources planning in favour of short-term economics. Indeed, Charles III's garden in his Gloucestershire home is inspired by Islamic traditions and plants mentioned in the Quran. So in 2006, during a visit to Al-Azhar University in Egypt's Cairo, King Charles criticised the publication of Danish cartoons a year earlier which mocked the Prophet Muhammad. The true mark of a civilised society is the respect it pays to minorities and to strangers, he said. The recent ghastly strife and anger over the Danish cartoons shows the danger that comes to our failure to listen and respect what is precarious and sacred to others. And I'm pretty sure that the king would know that this philosophy always comes at a cost to your own belief system and to your own community. This is not an, uh, an Israelite or Hebrew philosophy. This is an Edomite philosophy which is inclusive of all religions and intermarrying between these pagan religions and peoples. It wasn't the first time former prince reportedly contributed to a debate on Islam and freedom of speech in the West. In 2014, author Martin Amis told Vanity Fair that he argued with Charles over his apparent refusal to support Salman Rushdie after a fatwa was issued against him following the publication of the Satanic Verses. Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini declared a fatwa against Rushdie, whose 1989 novel was accused of insulting Islam. Amos claimed that Charles told him that he would not offer support if someone insults someone else's deepest convictions. I hope, Charles, that you don't take offence at my insult of yourself and your family origins. Following the publication of the book, Rushdie's Norwegian publisher was shot, his Italian translator was stabbed and his Japanese editor was murdered. Rusty himself was severely injured last month after being reportedly stabbed at a public appearance in New York. Charles has spoken for the need of those in the West to better understand Islam, particularly during a much-cited October 1993 speech. If there is much misunderstanding in the West about the nature of Islam, there is also much ignorance about the debt our own culture and civilization owe to the Islamic world. It is a failure which stems, I think, from the straitjacket of history which we have inherited. He said that at the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies almost three decades ago. He said that Islam had preserved a metaphysical and unified view of ourselves and the world around us, which the West had lost following the scientific revolution. He also called on people to resist the temptation to associate ex extremism with Islam. We must not be tempted to believe that extremism is in some way the hallmark and essence of the Muslim. Extremism is no more the monopoly of Islam than it is the monopoly of other religions, including Christianity, he said. The vast majority of Muslims, though personally pious, are moderate in their politics. Theirs is the religion of the middle way. The Prophet himself always disliked and feared extremism. Hmm. Uh, this is, you know. The prophet disliked and feared extremism, yet he uh, promoted convert or die. In 2013 speech, the World Islamic Economic Forum in London, Charles III displayed detailed knowledge of Islamic finance and the benefits he believed it could bring to global financial markets. It is surely a good idea to explore how the spirit inherent in the moral economy of Islam could enable a just and ethical approach towards the management of systematic risk in economics, in business and finance, he said. The way risk sharing implicit in Musharraka works, for example, with lenders sharing the borrower's risks and the notion of Mudaraba, the sharing of profit. Sounds communist to me. 
This is very different from the way that conventional finance transfers the risk quickly and frequently onto someone else with profit going just one way. Uh, well, we know that profit goes just one way to the Windsor family, but that seems okay. He went on to use Islamic concept of riba, usury, to make a comment on the equatability of nature resource consumption. I suspect that if the strict injunction of the Quran against riba were to be applied to the economic system that prevails at the moment, then the debt we have effectively incurred for future generations by the depletion of the earth's natural capital would surely be found to be usurious and profoundly unacceptable, he said. Could we read a carbon tax into this statement? And, you know, when we go back and look at how Islam took over the Holy Land back in the first millennium, we see that the Islamic world put a tax on those who would not convert to Islam. And, you know, perhaps this carbon tax is a tax on those who will not convert to the environmentalism and the nature worship of Charles III, a potential mark of the beast in the sense that if you do not convert to this religion, you will receive a mark which is in the hand or in the forehead or a tax that we have to give over to the beast. This is why financial and business organisations that keep to the principles embedded with Islam could be helpful in forging a more ethical approach that leads to equitable outcomes. Charles III has frequently remarked on the contribution of Muslims to science, art and academia. We need to remember that we in the West are in debt to the scholars of Islam for it was thanks to them that during the Dark Ages in Europe, the treasures of classical learning were kept alive, he said at Al-Azur University in 2006. Three years earlier at the Markfield Institute for Higher Education in Leicestershire, he commented on Islam's contribution to mathematics. Anyone who doubts the contribution of Islam and Muslim to Europeans' renaissance should, as an exercise, try to do some simple arithmetic using Roman numerals. Thank goodness for Arabic numerals and the concept of zero, introduced into European thought by Muslim mathematicians. In his famous 1993 speech, he spoke of a woman's right, <laughs> a woman's rights advance in Muslim countries preceded that of some in the West. Islamic countries like Turkey, Egypt, and Syria gave women the vote as early as Europe did its women and much earlier than in Switzerland. In those countries, women have long enjoyed equal pay and the opportunity to play a full working role in their societies. So if Charles III has indeed studied Islam and the origins of Muhammad, he would know that they come from Nabatea or Petra. He would also know that Petra was originally Mecca. And if he is indeed a secret Herod, his descendants come from this particular city. So is it any wonder he has a preference towards Islam in, and uh, Muhammad? Muhammad being one of the Nabataean royalty, marrying into Nabataean royal family and trading family. So he's only supporting a system that was invented by Nabataean and Edomite or Arabic, Arab meaning. The word Arab comes from the Hebrew word Arav, which means to mix a substance or to penetrate with foreign matter. The word is used to express mingling or mixing. In Aramaic, the word Arab corresponds to co-mingle. And isn't this exactly what Esau did? We have in the Old Testament, Esau marrying Canaanite women and Hittite women. Uh, he, the Edomites mixed with the Nabataean people who were a mixture of Canaanites and Ishmaelites, the son Ishmael, son of Abraham also and the Egyptian woman mixed in with Esau and his people. The Babylonians, they come from Iraq. And so the Arabic people are basically just a mixed people. We have in Paul Wexler's book, The Non-Jewish Origins of the Spartic Jews, uh, he basically 
traces the Sephardic language back to Berber and Arabic origins. Deuteronomy 17.15, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. And at the moment and for the past and since the Crusades and before, we've had kings ruling over us who are not our brother. So this aristocratic line of Europe are not related to our people. They are not of our people. We have a usurping royalty that is ruling over us and they are not related to us at all. And why do they want to rule over us and inherit the earth? I mean, we went through the First World War to enable the Balfour Declaration. We went through World War II to instigate this uh, nation of Israel. And as I've said, it's just another crusade. As in the First Crusades, we had the Pierre Leone banking Jewish family behind the Vatican pushing for crusade to take back the Holy Land. And that's exactly what they did. We had the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which was ruled by the French aristocracy or the aristocracy of Europe, marrying into the Armenian royal family, uh, integrating that into the European aristocracy. Why is it so important for them to have this region? And I believe that it's coming genetically from their Edomite background, Esau was obsessed with regaining his inheritance that he lost because of his intermixing with Canaanite people, because of his lack of respect for his parents and his God, that he didn't care about his inheritance, but he was angry that he lost his inheritance to his younger brother Jacob. And the inheritance was to Abraham the land of Palestine, uh, Jerusalem. It was the jewel in the crown of the Silk Road and the whole world economic system at that time. Everybody had to pass through this region of land for trade from east to west. And now they are establishing the Belt and Road, the ancient Silk Road system again and wanting to dominate this region of land from the Ukraine all the way down to Israel calling it Big Israel, they are obsessed with this region because they want to claim their inheritance, uh, the inheritance that went to Jacob. We know in the First World War that Benjamin Disraeli was massively influential in getting the Balfour Declaration established. Uh, this was He was a Jew clearly was in with the banking Jewish families of London, but had full support of the British crown. And now we know why. We know why at least the uh, British royal family uh, coming from Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, was Jewish and they had an agenda there. But going back even further, I mean, they were related to these crusader families which failed in their first attempt to claim this region of land. They've failed since the fall of Jerusalem back to the Romans and I believe it's a Herod agenda to claim this region. The dragon family wants to rule this region of land and the world. It's always been possible for them to do basically and they're attempting to do it again. But they'll fail this time too. They're declaring war now against Palestine, against Gaza, and this will be their downfall. As for the Christian Zionists who are waiting for this third temple to be built, well, you know, let's consider that the temple now that is on the Temple Mount is a mosque where Muhammad was said to ascend to heaven on his horse Barak or lightning ascend and descend from heaven on lightning basically like satan himself and so i don't think these people care that there is a islamic temple on the temple mount i don't think they need to rebuild the temple because they're quite happy with this religion that they created 
out of Petra and Nebatea. So thanks for listening, everyone. I don't know when I'll be back again, but perhaps in the future I'll have something more important to say. See you then.